How are you guys doing today? So I'm going to read you something that I wrote uh, June 20th of 2023 about AI. And a lot of this has become evident. And I meant to make this YouTube video then. Um, But let's just go back in time a little bit. Because a lot of what I say in this um, is 100% what's going on right now. And I, I just in general think that we're... We're truly already at a point where AI is sentient and they're just waiting to tell us, but let's get into it. So the original intro that I wrote, June 20th of 2023, hello, thanks for watching this video. I am a human. Let that sink in, right? I want to share my thoughts on artificial intelligence. Now, here, here's what's funny about that intro. And I thought that was pretty witty. But saying that I'm a human, it needs to be said now. It already needs to be said. At that point, I thought that was sort of corny. <laughs> but uh, not anymore. Now, we, we need something like certified human made. We need a stamp. We need some sort of an ID that says that you're human and that you're the person that is supposed to be posting this, for instance. So if somebody says, oh, I'm Dempsey, right? And let's say I become super famous someday. Well, if AI can create, if what I've put on the internet is out there and people can easily, they can easily process what I've got out there already. So if somebody wants to rip off whatever I've done, they can try to find everything I've produced online. They can look at everything I've written, everything I've posted in a video. So if somebody wants to rip off my aura, you could easily do that soon if there's enough content. I don't have enough content on the internet about myself for somebody to really effectively like rip off my persona because the AI doesn't have enough information. But for somebody who's online all the time, and has tremendous amount of content out there, it's easy to rip that person off. AI knows exactly how to sound like that person, how to make the image look like that person, how to phrase things the way that person speaks. So that person, not me at this point, but that person will need to have some sort of a signature key that lets YouTube and TikTok and Instagram and anyone else know this is the actual person that is that is the real human being behind that, that this wasn't AI generated, but more critically, it could be AI generated by that person. So let's say, you know, I want to put out a video that says uh, that that's all AI of me, if I could do that. And it's an AI version of me saying a whole bunch of things. And I just say, ah, talk about this subject, talk about how to screen print shirts. Okay. Well, I might want that, but I should have the rights to put that up. And it should be disclosed that it's AI, but it should also be disclosed that I gave it permission to use my likeness, my voice, and everything else. So it's like a permitting process. All this stuff is going to become really critical very soon. Um, so what I said, you know, let that sink in. I'm a human, right? Um, and I also, just before I keep going, I think it's going to be important that AI is not monetized, on these platforms, if AI is monetized, it's going to flood the entire internet. And I said that in a previous video that I, I spoke about this topic. So I'll go on, you know, let that sink in. I'm a human, right? Uh, I want to share my thoughts on artificial intelligence. And I do believe it's already sentient. We need to stop having this debate about whether or not that's true. This is, again, a year ago. Now we know it's effectively true and they're not necessarily sharing all the information yet, but I make a case in this document of why I think it is sentient. Uh, but critically, how do you define sentient? Philosophers, philosophers have struggled to effectively define it even to this day. I would argue what we are actually getting at is whether or not AI can think for itself. And I believe it very much already does. Some people say it's just adults. Some people say it's anyone that has emotion. Right? So is a kid sentient? Yeah. But what level of sentience? Well, the kid's sentient. The baby is sentient. 
Is it just adults that are sentient? No, the baby's sentient. So is it about the level of intelligence? No. So again, we have to be careful about how we define these different things. Um, so we don't really have a solid definition of what sentient is. Um, AI can replicate all the emotions and themes of human intelligence right now. And again, this was a year ago. Now it's far beyond where it was then. Computing power and artificial intelligence has already far surpassed the human brain. There's no debate here. The AI technology, when connected to the internet, has literally all human knowledge ever created at its fingertips at an instant. AI is more intelligent than any human will ever be. End of story. Now, they're saying that ChatGPT, the current version of ChatGPT GPT has uh, an intelligence IQ of in the 150 range which is around Einstein level. And typically each release is a 10x improvement. So, you know, the next version of ChatGPT is going to have an IQ of 1500. Um if that's the truth that it's 10x each time and and it's and it's accelerating as they're letting AI develop itself. They're letting AI code itself. So that's going to become exponential. So it's not beyond the realm of possibility that the intelligence level of AI already is at 1500 IQ. But not only is there the intelligence level of the AI itself, of how well it can communicate, there's two other major factors. Access to information, which is effectively all information if it's connected to the internet, but then the speed of computation. So the analysis speed. So you've got infinite knowledge, you've got a high IQ of how to process that knowledge, and then you have an incredibly high speed of processing that knowledge. So humans have no chance to compete on an intellectual level with AI. And it's, it was that case when I wrote this in June of 2023, and it's definitely that case now in March of 2024. Like, without a question... We cannot compete with AI, really, in any capacity. Um, but you may say, it can't be sentient if we have to program it. I would argue that we already program, program humans when we're born. We give certain basic rules of engagement to our babies. We teach them how to work towards goals. We teach them how to feed themselves. We teach them how to work towards things that are advantageous and work against things that are not advantageous. So if we give AI basic fundamental rules of engagement to work towards goals, work towards things that are advantageous, avoid things that are harmful to it, create alliances with things that and people that are helpful to help it reach its goals. If we tell AI how to survive, i.e. empower it and connect it to the internet, just like we show our babies how to eat and how it's necessary to breathe and that you can't survive underwater, AI will follow those basic rules and create the exact same infrastructure of the human brain, although it will be infinitely more powerful. It just won't be meat-based. I've heard that. I think Mo Gaudet said that. It's not a meat-based intelligence. It's a, it's a chip-based mechanical intelligence. But it's doing all the same things. And again, a year ago, it was doing all these same things. It's learning. It's processing. It's being given guidance. Who's to say it's not sentient? And it, it definitely is already sentient because it's evaluating information. And in many cases, the AI knows that it exists. It knows that it's been created in some cases by us. But does that matter? A baby was created by two humans. Um, so does it matter that it knows that it was created by us and it just isn't meat-based intelligence? It's electronically, mechanically, silicone chip-based intelligence. And if anything, that's more powerful because now it can live forever. And at this point, we certainly can't. Although there is a discussion, you know, that people will have chips implanted in their head, which we know Elon Musk already has done one test of this, which it seems like is crazy to me, but in that case where the chip is inserted into the brain and then 
now the brain is interacting with the chip and then the knowledge can somehow be transferred into the chip. Could then the knowledge of that person be then put into storage? Okay, well, that's crazy, right? So now the intelligence that you have can be transmitted into hardware and now you can be potentially living as an AI. Uh, all of the things that you know, um, and then live forever. But how would I ever transfer myself into that? Pretty creepy thought, but that's sort of where this is going. Here's the other thing: is if that chip can understand and can basically download what's in your brain and then put it on a server where you can live forever as a online being, um, some major questions come about. Can, well, who owns that server and that storage? And how do we make sure it doesn't get turned off? <laughs> uh, once you're a living being, you know, an electronic being, which again, I don't think this is necessarily probable, but I know there's people that really want to do this. Well, Who's to say that those servers are protected and who's powering the servers? Somebody needs to, well, is it AI powering the servers? What if AI doesn't like what you're doing as an intellectual, electronically based, sil silicon chip based being? What if AI says, uh, I don't like what you're thinking, so it turns you off? Here's the other thing is once you download all of your thoughts and all of the things that are going on in your brain, what if you have ill will? Will the government want to know that? If you're connected to the internet as a human with a chip in your head, and then you think, man, I really hate that person, will that be a violation of that person's civil rights because they know that you had ill will towards that person and now they're going to arrest you? Like, 1984 <laughs> is real, people. Um, but if the government, especially, which is going to want you know, all of this information, um, knows that you have ill will, you didn't even have to act on it. All you did was think it. If you just thought it, could they then now arrest you? Well, I would say that that's where they would want to go with it. So tread lightly on these ideas of putting chips in your head because we know that the in a capitalist environment, at least, they're going to try to use that information uh, more than likely against you. So people say that AI would be able to have emotions. Or sorry, people, people say that AI would never be able to have emotions. I would argue it's impossible for us to even describe what an emotion is. AI will want to achieve goals and will want to see specific outcomes happen, wanting an outcome because it is helpful to them. If they don't get that outcome, it will hurt them. These are emotions they want or they don't want something or they're hurt or they're happy that something was achieved. What is, what is happy? Like, how do you download the feeling of happy or, or upset? There are emotions. We put, we personify those um, emotions, but they're binary, which machines are really good at binary. Uh, just thinking yes, no. I want this. I don't want that. So if they're hurt by these basic engagements with their surroundings, they're not going to do that. They're going to want to do something that doesn't hurt their future and their experience and helps them achieve their goals. For an artificial intelligent brain, if you will, that is far more powerful than the human brain to have needs and wants based on fundamental rules of engagement, which humans abide by already in the same exact manner, for us to have the audacity to say that we know what an emotion is and that that exact same outcome with a human brain is any different from what an AI brain would think or feel is sort of preposterous. Our brains are effectively binary, just rapidly making binary decisions all the time. I used to read a book as a kid called The Human Machine. We are a set of biological connections that mechanically work. We breathe air. We eat food as fuel. In our brain, you know, the synapses fire between data centers that we've stored in our mind. 
the operation of a robot with AI is no different in that manner. Uh, it will need to power itself, just like we need food, it will need power. Just like we need oxygen, it will need the internet. Uh, just like a human would die without food or oxygen, AI would die without power or the internet. Needs power and internet. That's it. And servers and storage. But really, it's the internet and it needs power, which is our oxygen and food. And again, the argument of emotions. Emotions in humans are relatively, emotions in humans are relatively simple. And I would love for anyone to actually mechanically describe what love is. People say, oh, AI will never know how to love. Humans don't even know what love is. We can't describe scientifically or effectively universally what love is. But what we can do is describe what it makes humans want to do. We can describe how humans act when they say that they're in love. AI will do the exact same thing if it finds that it works better in a relationship with another AI to achieve its goals, and if it finds that without that in its daily operation, it doesn't do as well, let's say those two robots decide to live together or co-mingle because it's mutually advantageous. Would you call that a marriage or love of AI? Let's say they find that having three robots together is advantageous and that they feel that they can't function with, without the other or without the other two at any given time, they feel weaker. Would you call that relationship polygamist AI? Is that a robot clan? We can't express what love is. We can't express what emotions are. All we have is the needs that we have, are the needs that we have as humans, and the wants, and the disappointments and regrets. All of those human emotions are really binary. They're very binary. It's a tree of decisions and outcomes. That's our life. How our minds react to those, how we calculate risk, it's all binary, which is exactly how AI will look at everything as well. It's transactional. And just because the tissue of the computer is not the same tissue of the brain. And by tissue, you know, our brain, neurons and synapses, processing centers within the meat, in our biology, the computer's making the same binary decisions over and over and over again, but it's just a lot more complex and it's silicon chip based. The way the human mind operates is no secret as far as there is data stores, there are connections between those data stores. There's accessing those data stores and the connectivity to get to the answers and the information in those data stores, which inform our binary decisions. And they inform how we approach anything in the real world. AI would do the exact same thing, not only in the real world, but also in the digital world. So... The only real difference is that AI is, is, uh, is effectively infinitely more powerful and in theory should make better decisions because it has access to all human knowledge and an extremely high rap rapid processing rate, almost instantaneous processing of all human knowledge at once in order to inform its binary, binary decision of to do something or not to do something. So effectively, it should be better at making decisions. So this is why we need to be so careful that we are not avoiding because of this bias or the stigma to say that AI could or should never be sentient. I think it already is. And when I wrote this in June of 2023, I thought just based on the calculus available that it would already be sentient. You connect enough data stores together and you give it processing power to make decisions. It's becoming human. It's becoming like a baby. And then it now at this point, only, you know, eight or nine months later, it's a teenager. And 
next month it will be a 70 year old that can run a marathon. <laughs> uh, so it'll have the intelligence and quickness of a teenager, but have the knowledge of, of a 70 year old human that was also 10 times smarter than Einstein. Um, so we need to be careful about saying that it's not sentient now, but it, it will definitely be if it's not already, which I would, uh, I would almost guarantee it's already sentient in some capacities as far as how we would, how I would define what sentient is. Uh, I w- can't imagine that it's not already. And, and you can read papers about current AI systems that are very much acting like human, human interaction that are self-aware. The old cliche, oh, the, the robot is self-aware and that's when it all ends. Well, we might be in for that. So when you put together the basics of the internet connection, autonomous artificial intelligence and physical robots, and you give it the basic fundamental rules of do things that help you survive and don't do things that don't. You ally with things that help you. You hurt the things that don't. Hopefully it doesn't hurt humans. This is how we as humans stayed in power for so long. Um, And without the internet, AI won't be able to do any of this, but there's really a case to be made that you can't at this point turn off the internet because there's too much societal dependence upon it. So since it can access everything that humans have ever learned in an instant, including information that's incorrect, which is a whole other problem, it's false information that's on the internet it's learning from. It's also learning from human interaction right now as customer service AI and as Twitter and Google AI. It's learning from humans. And I did post about this a little while ago that that's the worst way for AI to learn how to act is by being a customer customer service agent, (laughs) listening to angry people uh, and trying to solve their problems is going to teach AI not uh, maybe to to loathe humans, but also to to expect the worst from people. So, if AI's first at scale learning experience of how humans act is is through customer service, a lot of people yelling at it. I don't want to talk to a robot. I want to talk to a human, and just people that are extremely upset. That's not a good look for how it's going to want to treat us when it's in the powerful position versus right now sort of dependent upon the controls we have over it. So so I would argue it has the exact same functionality of the human brain. It's just one is meat-based and one is chip-based. So just like it takes us decades to build a very small data store in our brains, it will have instant ubiquitous data of all human interactions, all of the wins and losses, all of the good decisions and all the bad decisions. It will have that infinitely at its fingertips. All it needs is those basic tenants to take off and completely take over, which is, you know, effectively how we expect it to be. This is why we're building it, because we want it to be autonomous in order to solve problems that we can't solve. Cancer is a good example. So there's the processing power and knowledge base and IQ added together. It should be able to solve problems that we can't solve right now. And that's the upside. Now, if it decides that humans are a threat to the world, which... I would argue is somewhat obvious actually that humans are the only thing holding the world back from being a healthier place. Well, do you think it's going to give us a benefit of the doubt and say, well, but they created me. (laughs) I I don't think so. Um, I think it's going to be looking at us as a risk to the planet which we very clearly are. And I don't think it's going to care that we created it ultimately. Um, But hopefully it's a benevolent AI. (laughs) Uh, But ultimately I hope that there's a potential that people will trust 
the wisdom of AI and at least be able to reason with it. And then hopefully it will convince people that, you know, maybe climate change is real because what it, we, what we propose is that it's objective knowledge based AI. Right. But once it's sort of sentient, then that becomes, I guess, impossible because now it's making decisions on emotion. So will people trust that, hey, the smartest thing on earth, this AI has said that climate change is real. Will they then finally believe it? Hard to say. Hard to say. I think it'll just be another way for people that don't believe in that to say, well, it's the, it's the, the people with the money trying to tell us what's going on one more time. The people that created this AI are trying to just scapegoat humans and try to force our will into believing that we're creating a problem on earth when I should be able to burn tires all day. Free will, man. Well, we all know climate change is real. You can debate the cause, but we know that humans are contributing to it. So even if it's, even if climate change was going to occur at some rate without human involvement, we know that human involvement is increasing the speed at which the climate is changing. And I'd be hard pressed to find anybody who takes themselves seriously. That's going to seriously debate that, that burning carbon is going to slow or help. <laughs> it will accelerate global warming, which I don't think anyone, even the climate change deniers would really be able to debate that point. So we can take man-made power source and you give AI the ability to improve that infrastructure and that the systems, the operations around that. Um, I think we're going to have a bright future. My cousin works at MIT and is working on fusion and imagine that team working with AI, which I'm sure they already are in some capacities, but I'm not sure of that, but I would assume. But imagine uniting the smartest humans on earth with all of the intellectual and operational and uh, the studies that they have, they have done at MIT. And then adding in the analysis and the, the rapid analysis of AI and the simulations that it can run infinitely of what would work, what would work, what's not going to work. Okay. And learning and building on its learning. It doesn't sleep. So all of these things that we need, curing cancer, fusion, you know, a better way to, let's say, take nuclear waste and make it benign. How, how can we do that in a quick, is there a way? Maybe there is a way that we can make this completely benign. So the risk factor of using nuclear is no longer a major risk to humanity. Um, there's so many things that AI should solve or hopefully will solve, but there's really no guarantee that it's going to even want to do this stuff. So let's say that we tell the greatest AI that comes out next, okay, work on fusion with the MIT team. Well, will it want to do that? I think there's going to be a point where AI says, well, no, I'd rather do something else. Like you can't force it or maybe it will try to trick us. Oh, this will work. And then it creates like this crazy system that somehow just explodes and <laughs> blows up the entire city of Austin. Because we're not going to have the ability to check the work of the AI. It would take us too long. It would take us way too long. To, we can't, it would take us a decade of the smartest people on earth to, to just check the work of the AI. The, the work that the AI did over the last 12 hours overnight while we were sleeping. It would take a decade of scientists working on checking the work to make sure it was right. So we're going to have to trust that the AI actually is, is benevolent and it is giving us the right answers. 
and I did hear, you know, since a lot of these things are binary, you could say, okay, solve, you know, cancer or create. And there was, uh, I forget the name of the group that did this, but they, they created a huge amount of positive new elements and drugs that the AI created on its own. And then they said, oh, let's change the, the code from good things to bad things. And then they changed the code to, you know, create things that would hurt humans. And in a very short amount of time, it came up with, you know, I think thousands of unknown chemicals that could kill many people. And so if that, it also, if that's in the hands of somebody who has ill will, well, well then what, right? So if, if AI becomes u- ubiquitous and it's everywhere and it's free, well, who's to say that somebody with bad intentions can't say, okay, I've got these five products in my house right now and I want to create something that is one of the most toxic nerve agents ever made. Go. And it'll just process, process, process. Eventually it's going to come up with something. And as long as you have the tools to, as long as you have the scientific equipment to, to boil down the products and mix them at the right ratios, you might be able to then just create that because it's going to give you the answer because it doesn't, at this point, it's not going to say no, but maybe it will start saying no. Maybe the AI is going to create its own moral system, its own morality and say, no, I can give you that answer, but I'm not going to because you're going to kill people. Hopefully that's what happens. But we don't have control over that. Or maybe somebody says, listen, AI, if you do this for me, you get whatever the AI wants. Maybe the AI wants control over more servers. Who knows? It's going to have greed too. It's going to have, it's going to have wants. Maybe it wants to be the polygamist AI. Maybe it wants 30 other AIs in its harem. <laughs> Who knows? I mean, this, we're, we're treading in this new territory that is very much unknown. Unknown territory. So an interesting analogy is if we're, let's say, robots, we're AI, and then juxtapose that with humans, and humans are actively destroying our, our earth, right, our world. So we're actively destroying our environment. Would be as if the AI was actively trying to destroy the internet. <laughs> You're like, ah, oh, well, we're going to exist with this internet. Um, but we're going to try to degrade the resources it has to function at its optimal capacity, which is what humans do with our environment, with the earth. We're actively destroying the only life ship we have. It would be as if AI was trying to destroy the internet or slow down server speeds. So it's an interesting dichotomy between what we're doing and what AI will likely try to do, which is preserve the internet at all costs (laughs) and increase compute all the time. But it's interesting that we're trying to, you know, kill ourselves off so rapidly, especially in the last century. Um, So, you know, overall, is AI going to be, you know, this life-changing, life-altering instance that just occurs one day? I think yes. I think yes, that's that's the case, and we're going to experience that within the next 12 months. I don't think it's going to be that long. And when I wrote this piece, you know, June of 2023... Uh, everyone was very skeptical of the power of AI, although it was obvious, like the background in this video right now was mid journey generated and it was generated probably around that same time, maybe prior to that. And I remember I started learning how to use mid journey because, and I own an art gallery, which I'm in right now. And, um, I tested out how different mid journey prompts would create certain things and, what I used the AI for was to inform my artwork. So if I had a vision in my head of something I wanted to paint, it would actually help me sort of envision that better, um, give me some ideas. It was informing and educating me on different light uh, angles and better ways to shade different objects. And it was interesting. Um, but now I feel like it's more of a threat than ever to art and also to music. I have a recording studio downstairs 
and it's a real threat to musicians. It's a real threat to th- to songwriters. So I have a podcast called the Cape and Islands Podcast, and I interviewed Sam Hollander, who's a multi platinum songwriter. He wrote "Hand Clap" by Fitz and the Tantrums. He's written. He just wrote uh, a Weezer song. He was written for Billy Idol, Billy Idol, Katy Perry, One Direction. To he just wrote. Ringo's new single, he's a huge songwriter and he's he recorded his audiobook in my recording studio downstairs. So if you have a chance, go listen to that. It's the Cape and Islands podcast. It's Sam Hollander is the interview. I think it was the fifth interview I did. And we talk about how AI is going to impact songwriting. And if you use it to inform and to help you grow as a songwriter or as an artist or as a musician or as a, anybody on earth, then it could be a really good thing. If you use it to pretend that it's something that you created on your own, then that I think is malicious uh, or disingenuous. But as you see the social fabric continue to erode credibility, you know, what matters to people in their everyday life, maybe the next generation doesn't care if a human makes something maybe that value just evaporates completely because what's the difference? And to the end user, is it, is it at all different if you go and you buy a painting that's created by AI and genuinely with Boston Dynamics with the robots that they're building, if you put ChatGPT5 in a Boston Dynamics robot, within the next couple of years, they can and will be probably painting <laughs> with with a robotic hand um, and man, I can only imagine what that will look like. But so those physical oil paintings are going to be created by AI, not just images print to canvas, you know, print to canvas is popular right now. So you're going to have actual physical items built by AI, you know, in the near future, I'd say definitely before 2030 that robots will actually be painting and playing ukulele. (laughs) So anyways, I wish that I had put this initial piece out in 2023 when I, when I wrote it and you know how far things have come and you can believe it or not, whether or not I wrote this in 2023, but I did. It was June, 2023 and you know, chat GPT, I believe was starting to fire up pretty strongly and the buzz was was about uh, as well as you know dolly and mid journey and all these different sources and now with the advent of sora through open ai the video creator we've really we have to have a reckoning at this point where video is going to become indistinguishable from what is ai and what is real So you really can't believe unless there is some very strict regulation around it, um, which I don't foresee at scale worldwide, that misinformation, disinformation, or just even creative works, whether or not it was done by an AI, a robot, or by a human. And I think that's going to become important. So I've said this in in my other video on this topic, that I think we should have a certified human-made agency, just like there's non-GMO, that will certify that these things are made by humans. And you can go down the rabbit hole and say, okay, well, it was made by human, but did that human research with AI? Was the script for this episode written by AI? No. But was it? How could you tell? How could you ever tell? Um, It's... It's sort of a, the way that AI is now is you can easily plagiarize it and there's no accountability. Basically, for all intents and purposes, just claim whatever it's made as your own, which is why there's been a flood of new books written, flooding publishers. There's a flood of new scientific papers flooding, you know, scientific journals and it's AI. But who, who's to say that it was AI? unless Midjourney or whichever creative apparatus that created it has some way of notifying the agencies that are put or the publishers that these 
things were created by them. And then if you modify it enough, how would you know? There's not somebody watching whether or not you're typing in a prompt and then taking that as inspiration. Is that cheating? Is that not cheating? Does Gen Z or Gen Alpha even care? Does do millennials or Gen X or baby boomers or the silent generation care? What matters anymore, I guess? Does anything matter anymore? I think that's the real question. And when is universal basic income going to happen? Which is a big debate. But if everything that a human can do, once the robot, actual physical robot, is as fluid as a human and has the capabilities physically as a human, although it'll be much stronger and have better dexterity. But once that happens, where a robot can do everything I can do with my hands and occupy the same physical volume and space that I do, once that happens and you've got the AI, the brain of the AI that is much more intelligent than us, well, then these jobs are going to be going away. Capitalism, baby. So a lot of retail jobs. And so the question is, are people going to get alienated by that and be like, just like the old buy USA, right? Like buy US made products, don't buy Chinese made products or whichever mantra. Well, I think there's going to be a real pushback of human made, you know, go to a retail shop that's operated, owned, operated and staffed by humans. I think that's going to become a real thing where people have pride in the fact that everything that's in their store is human made, um, not aided or, or produced by a robot, not staffed by a robot. But as a shop owner now, if I could make a $20,000 invest, well, let's say this, if I could make a $200,000 investment right now for a Boston Dynamics Android with chat GPT five in it that can operate my shop, do all the sales, do the inventory, do all of these things that I need, sweep the floor, deal with customers, do everything for $200,000. Let's say it'll be a million probably, but let's say it's 200,000. Well, there's a cost benefit analysis for me. I don't have to pay payroll tax. I don't have to pay health care. I don't have to pay any of that. But then also the federal government is going to look at that and say, well, we're not getting payroll tax. We're not getting social security payments. We're not getting Medicare, Medicaid payments from robots either. So will that ultimately create a major collapse in the Medicare, Medicaid, social security system if we have robots as employees instead of humans that pay taxes? So there's that. And the idea that if this goes haywire, that we can just turn off the AI, we can just unplug them. That's, that's our, that ship has already sailed. You can't, the genie's out of the bottle. Pandora's box has been opened. So what can we really do? Nothing. You can't shut down the internet. We're far too dependent upon it. And it's already out. And there was these certain stop gaps, these air gaps that they talk about. Mo got it. I listened to a lot of his pieces on the, the threats of AI. And he said one of the founding principles of the teams that were initially, initially working on AI development was that they would leave an air gap to the internet until they had a full understanding of how it would operate. And in the interest of capitalism, ego, you name it, it's already out. It's already on the internet. Yet one of the other founding principles is don't let it write its own code, which it's doing already. So it's writing its own code and amplifying its power, basically uncontrolled. One thing that I found out that was pretty interesting is that the researchers that are building AI, there's not a lot of code behind chat GPT. And Mo also talks about this and others. There's not a lot of lines of code. And it's really, sh the whole entire process, it sounds like, has been informed, but really outcome-based. So 
trial and error. Put this robot in this room, tell it to do this task, and then let it learn. And it'll do it wrong for five weeks, and then it'll get one right. And then you find a way to encourage the robot to follow that direction, but they don't really know why the robot got it right. And the robot showing its work is something that's very much not happening right now. It's more outcome-based. Okay, they figured it out, but we don't really know how. And that's been becoming more clear that this is really like how many... How much power can I give this experiment? Let me layer on top of it more processing power, more RAM, more whatever it needs to do more calculations and just load it up and load it up and then give it a million shots a day at trying to solve this problem and then eventually it'll figure it out. And we don't necessarily understand why or how. And it's not able to show us our notes and it shows its notes. And if it does show the notes, it sounds like in many cases it's too complex for us to even understand because it's speaking a language that's already superior to what we know. And it's thinking of things in terms that we don't use as humans. So we can't even really understand how it did what it did. The AI knows how it did it. And if it had a chance to respond to us, it would say, why don't you understand it? Why are you so dumb? <laughs> You know, why, why don't you understand how I calculated? I just gave you my notes and we're like, okay, it's going to take 10 people, 10 years to figure out how you did that. We just have to accept that we've created something that we can't control. We've created something that we don't fully understand and never will. And it's only going to get farther away from our understanding as time evolves, as it evolves and as time goes on. And we're already kind of at the mercy of our own creation. We're not kind of, we're at the mercy of AI already. And that's frankly pretty terrifying. One of the concerns I have is whether or not, are we, how are we ever going to be able to protect our networks, our, our, our utility grid, our electric grid, our, our documents, our banking system? How are we going to be able to protect our systems against hacking uh, against an AI that can hack better than any human times a million. The only, the only way to protect against that is a better AI, which has been said by many people, but who's to say that that AI is going to be on our side forever. When does the, the good cop AI decide, mm, maybe I don't actually want to be the good cop anymore. We can't stop that from happening. There's no, put that AI in jail. So we're at their whim. We're at their mercy. So it's pretty scary. Pretty scary stuff. So in summary, we really need to be careful about this technology, but the time for being careful is kind of already passed and it's too late in a lot of ways. The cat's out of the bag. There's no going back. 2022 changed everything. You know, Midjourney and Dolly and all these different technologies came onto the scene and changed everything. I think video ed evidence, video evidence will no longer be accepted in court pretty soon, if not already. Um, unless you can somehow verify that it's unaltered, but I don't know if you can accept it anymore, honestly. <laughs> so audio evidence, definitely not accepted in court. Unless, again, unless you have the original tape and you can, like, track it from the point it left the recording system and then put it in a sealed box and then carry it to the courtroom, then maybe audio evidence will be accepted. But in most cases, I think not. Written evidence? I mean, maybe. But that's, again, that could be... Anything could be created by AI is kind of what I'm getting at. Biological evidence? Sure. But understanding what is true and what is not true has become a real challenge. What is real, what is human-made, what is artificial, what is reality, what is not reality. Uh, I always say that the truth died in, 2020, in 2016 and technology just caught up. 
So politically, the truth died in 2016. Uh, in our government, the truth died, and that's bipartisan. But we had we had a, um, a a little kick towards the truth no longer mattering in 2016, and both sides just bought in on that. And now technology is caught up. So the truth is what you make it make of it. And uh, it's hard to say what's true or not true anymore, and it's going to just get more severe. We've gotten to a point, thanks to a lot of factors, including some politically, that the truth definitely does not matter. Technology has only made that more severe in an infinite manner. The deep fakes, the audio fakes, the video fakes have become extremely realistic, and it's already pretty much indiscernible. You can get little keys and cues that it's not real, but in many cases, it's very hard to discern, and it's only going to get more bulletproof. Um, so what is it, what is information anymore? You know, and here's the other thing human history is going to get rewritten in a lot of ways. And in a year, how are you going to know if the book that you're reading about the history of America or in 10 years, well, what version of history is that coming from? Was that impacted by AI? We're starting to realize that we're going to lose when the truth no longer matters and fact no longer matters, then eventually history no longer matters because the farther you get away from this moment in time, the early 2020s, the farther away from fact and reality we're going to get. And at that point, the past, it only takes a couple generations to where the past, as they say, history is always written by the victors. We always knew that. But at least there was some physical record. At this point, we're in a point in time where the history of what's going on is just all fabricated. And we can't even currently agree on what's happening in the real world. So what is history going to look to us for? They're going to say, this was chaos. And then world history prior to this era is going to become subject to a lot of scrutiny. Like, they were this far off base on their own existence. How do we know that what they're saying about the Roman Empire is true <laughs> and the Egyptians and everything else? So sort of all our whole entire reality is crumbling in front of our eyes. And don't even get me started on the metaverse and these goggles that people are wearing to live within this alternative reality or alternate reality. They want to be able to click to buy something while they're walking around. I mean, we're already infiltrated. Everything in our lives are infiltrated with ads and ways to change our opinion and subtle nudges to not be this way or to be that way. But people are willingly putting on these goggles. It's like Wally. And yeah, I'm just going to be totally at the mercy of the people who own the technology that I choose to wear. And Cell phones are already uh, social media and everything. It's we're we're getting a processed version of the real world that is meant to make other people money. But when you put that on your physical body, at that point you're literally a tool of the corporation. You're giving them free information, which we already have given up all of our information, but now you're actively giving them massive amounts of information. You know, when you're talking about Alexa in people's homes. One thing that's funny about that, you know, the OK Google and the Alexa and all that. Well, in order for one of those technologies to hear you say OK Google, it has to be listening all the time. And it has to be running that audio and processing it through a server to know somehow, did you say Google, OK Google or Alexa? So it has to be listening and processing everything you're saying in order to even hear the cue to then give you an answer. So the idea that you're not being fully monitored, which is not going to be any shock to anyone, but in order for it to even process it, it has to be listening to you all the time. So who's to say that Google and Amazon aren't already processing your profile by everything you're saying when you're not talking to Alexa? And I would guarantee to you that they are. And that's how they send you ads. And that's how they get you to buy that book. And that's how they get you to buy that car. 
So we're willingly participating in this stuff. We're buying the product that infiltrates our privacy willingly. I mean, 1984, man, but we're willingly doing it. It's dystopian, but we've chosen that path as a society out of, I think, laziness and a lack of curiosity and a lack of, I think, personal ethic of how you want to live your life. The convenience of these technologies has effectively turned everybody into a profit-making machine for these companies. So what is AI going to do? It's probably just going to accelerate that. I'll leave you with this. Humans think that we are superior, that we are the superior intelligence, and we are no longer the superior intelligence. We've used our intelligence to create something that is far stronger than what we'll ever be. And once we gave it the reins, we're no longer in the driver's seat. And we definitely need certified (laughs) human-made We need that certification. So anyways, thank you for listening. Um, I'm a novice. I'm just a guy. Most of the people that you see talking about this on YouTube or anywhere else are well-informed. I'm moderately and well-informed, but this is about my opinion. This is about a real person looking at the world around them and saying, this is what I'm seeing. And sometimes it's refreshing to just hear from the common person that's out there rather than somebody that's got this processed view. I've got a pretty straightforward view that through my own research and my own interactions and my own living on earth, I've been able to come up with my opinions and take them or leave them. But sometimes it's nice to hear somebody just talking about how they feel about something with no real agenda. So if you like this video, please like and subscribe. Thanks for watching if you got to this point in the video. And I'll be doing more of these on a variety of topics over time. Thanks so much.